please help me give it up for the one and only Dave Burstein. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure once again to uh, deliver this session. I really uh, enjoyed doing it. How many people uh, here uh, have heard my session in, in the last few years? Wow, a lot. Okay, so my challenge is to try to tell you something that I didn't tell you last year. Uh, there's a little bit of, there's a few things that I'm going to tell you that are similar to what the patterns were last year, sort of a continuation. Then we've got some new things, too. So the agenda. Give you some trends on the overall economy in the U.S. and a little bit on Canada. How many Canadians do we have here? Okay, we'll give you a little bit on Canada, but it's mostly going to be U.S. Uh, give you the, our outlook for our industry, uh, and not just today, but also what the industry looks like for next year, this year, for the rest of this year, and beyond. And then finally, give you some suggestions on what we think you should do to take advantage of the opportunities. So John already talked about this. I can skip that one. If my slide projector lets me. Okay. For those of you who have been to this, um, you know that we have lots of data. Uh, I have a total of 135 slides, uh, and there's nary a bullet slide among them. Uh, all kinds of charts and graphs. So my caution is try not to blink over the next hour, because if you do, you may miss one. I'm going to start with a little bit on the U.S. economy, and uh, this is just a trend chart over the past few years about GDP. And, and you know, with the exception of we had a, a negative quarter back here in 2013 and kind of dipped a little bit over here, but by and large, we've been just sort of chugging along in the 2%, maybe a little bit more uh, per year increase in GDP. And that's not real exciting, but since it's gone on for a long time, since the recession, cumulatively, it's not bad. Uh, for our Canadian friends, their performance is actually better. And we're looking at the most recent Canadian data being north of 4% growth in GDP. So Canada actually seems to be, and, and in fact, Canada did better than the U.S. even during the recession and has done better since then. So with the exception of some Western Canadian mining and energy industries, Canada is doing pretty good. I thought this was an interesting thing, and I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about Trump, you know, you can't, you're, I, I don't think anybody's allowed to make a speech right now this year without mentioning Trump in some fashion, so I will talk a little bit about him. And, and this is, I think, a really interesting pattern here, and it shows why I think Trump won the election. First of all, died in the wool Democrats, they pull the Democratic lever every year, it doesn't matter who's on the ballot. Died in the wool Republicans, they pull the Republican lever every year, it doesn't matter who's on the ballot. So those, those votes are not up for grabs. It's the guys in the middle that are up for grabs. And what's happened over the past few years, or decades really, since the 70s, is if you look at these two quintiles, the bottom 40% have not seen any wage increases since 1979 in real terms. And, and worse than that, they're seeing people who are making a lot more money, the top quintile, doing really good. And so that's caused a huge amount of resentment. I think this is, this is the same effect that got Trump elected in places like Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and all of those states that typically go to Democratic. But I think it's also the reason that Barack Obama got elected. People are looking for something different. The, bot the, the bottom 40% are fed up, and they're looking for something different. Barack Obama came along, he was different. Donald Trump came along, he was different. Same thing got, got both of them elected. Let's look at our industry. Um, on the revenue side, here is uh, the recession that we went through in the, uh, the, the last recession, 2008 through 2010. And you can see, unlike previous recessions, like if you look at the recession in the early 2000s, we never actually, as an industry, saw a decrease in revenue. We saw a dip in the amount of increase, but we never saw a decrease. Well, this one we saw a decrease, and it was, in some cases, a pretty big decrease. But the good news is it's come back pretty strong. In the last few years, we've been increasing revenues somewhere between 5 and 10% per year. So that's pretty good. There's another thing that's happening in the U.S. economy, and that is consolidation. If you go back to 1980, 
and you look at the number of, of new companies that are starting to be formed and the number of companies that are going out of business, you can see that both of these trends have been declining since 1980 and in fact declining significantly. We're seeing more consolidation across the U.S. economy. The same thing has been happening in our industry. Uh, if you look at information back until 2014, we took, we took some ENR data uh, and we crunched the data from the years of 2009 through 2014 and what we saw was the biggest companies saw the most growth and in particular, the biggest companies saw the most, most growth from M&A. Uh, if, you, if you take out the M&A portion, it's still that way, but not nearly as much. So the same consolidation that we've been seeing across the U.S. economy, we're seeing in our industry. But since 2014, some things have changed. And now what we're seeing is that the mega companies are actually losing revenue. Even with all these acquisitions that they're making, if you look at all the companies that, that have more than a billion dollars a year in revenue, that these are the big generally publicly traded companies, they've actually lost about 6% of revenue between 2014 and 2017. The companies that are making the revenue are the smaller companies, small and mid-sized companies. So that's a real change. Now, when the deal that I'm going to talk more about, where, where CH2M is being bought by Jacobs, when that goes through, that's going to, that one deal alone is going to make a, a big change. But, the, but I think the pattern in that change is, is instructive. And, and I think this may be the reason why, well, before I get into the reason why, it's, it's e that pattern is even evident in the bastion of the big firms, which is design-build. Design-build has been historically a big firm market. And what's really interesting, when we went, we went back to 2008, and we compared, uh, we looked at the percentage of U.S. construction dollars. We took the U.S. construction dollars from the U.S. Census Bureau, and we took the, the amount of revenue in design build from the top 100 ENR companies, and it's been really interesting when you do the math, you find that even in the market that is really tailor-made for the big companies, it's still pretty flat, between 6 and 7% of all design build revenues go to the top 100 biggest design build firms. That means over 90% is going to you guys. And we're seeing more and more design build being regional and local and really not an increase in the national amount. <clears throat> Here's another reason. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> when we looked at employee turnover by firm size, and this pattern is not just this year. We've seen this pattern for the last few years. What we're seeing is the largest firms have the highest turnover. So if, if, if we're not constrained as an industry by sales, but rather we're constrained by the ability to hire and retain people, and the biggest companies are losing people faster than anybody else, so it's no surprise that their revenue is declining. And so what this is creating here, I think, is, is the perfect storm. Anybody see that movie? This is a little snapshot from that movie, The Perfect Storm. Three major, thing, three major storms all converged at once in, in, the, in, in this movie, which is an actual true story. And we see three major forces converging again. One, firms are growing again. Uh, I'll show you some data on that in a minute. The second, turnover is starting to pick up, and I'll show you data on that. And the third is we're starting to see a mass exodus of retirements from the baby boomer, boomer generation. All three of those things are all coming together to cause a major change in our industry. So let's talk about the first one. If you look at total employment in the United States, you can see before the recession, uh, you know, we were at about a employed. Uh, that dropped down to about 130 million at the bottom of the recession. And now you can see we're actually well above. We're about 147 million people employed in the United States. That's everybody. If we look at our market, a, the A&E sector, this is all A&E firms. You can see that pre-recession, we were at about 1.45 million people. That dropped down to about 1.25 million. We lost about 200,000 our jobs in our, 200,000 jobs in our, in our sector. And that's now actually slightly above where it was pre-recession for the first time. <clears throat> now, 
The other interesting thing I thought was there was a period here during 2015 and, two, and early 2016 where there was no growth. And so a lot of people were able to kind of catch up, but now the growth has definitely resumed. And in fact, if anything, it's even, the curve is even steeper than before. So we're seeing a lot of growth in the industry creating demand for people. If we break it down by engineering and architecture, what we see is there's a different picture. The engineering firms are considerably, as a group, are considerably above the employment of what they were before. Um, now almost a million people work in engineering firms. This is all employees working in engineering firms. And if we look at architecture firms, it's a very different picture. Architecture firms <clears throat> had a steeper drop and a shallower recovery, and they're not even close to where they were pre-recession. But the pattern, the trend is definitely there. If we look at the construction side of the AEC industry, um, they're also behind. They haven't caught up yet either. But again, the trend is there, and they're going to be catching up. This shows the relationship between the number of people looking for jobs in blue and the number of jobs looking for people in red. And you can see, if you go back pre-recession, they were fairly close together, but historically, the number of people looking for jobs has always been greater than the number of jobs looking for people. That's changing. And today, those two lines are almost crossing. What that means is there's now literally a job available for every single person who's looking for one. Now, the problem, of course, is the people looking for the jobs don't necessarily have the same skills <clears throat> as, as the employers are looking for. So there's a skills gap, but in terms of absolute numbers, these two graphs have never been this close. If you look at the amount of time that it takes to hire people, prior to the recession, it took about 23 days on average to fill a vacancy. Today, it's about 30 and going up. So as those two lines converged on this graph, it's taking longer to find people. And this is not specialized people like you guys hire. This is everybody. If we look at employee turnover, this one kind of surprises a lot of people. Um, back in 1985, when we first started tracking this data, for the, during the late 1980s, the average turnover, the median turnover, was right around 20% per year. In other words, the average tenure of employees in our industry was about five years. And that, if you do a little regression, which is what that red line is, that has dropped significantly over the years. And you can see there's been some ups and some downs, but overall, it's gone from being about 20% down to being around 12%. That's a huge benefit to you guys. It means that the average employee is now staying with your firm eight years instead of five years, which helps all kinds of things. It helps you be more efficient. It helps keep costs down, does a lot of things. But if we take a three-year moving average of the same data, what we see now is that there are some cyclical ups and downs and it looks like we're in the beginning of a cyclical upturn in employee turnover rate. So I don't think that the low turnover rate that we've been having is going to continue. There's been a lot of talk about replacing these guys with these guys. Um, robots are doing more things. There's been you know, a recent book about how robots are going to take over all the jobs that we have and everybody's going to be out of work and nobody knows what to do with it. But if you look at the people that are employed in our industry, the average U.S. worker, according to this particular study, has about a 47% chance of being replaced by a robot in the next few years. But if you look at engineers and architects, um, the highest is electrical engineers. I'm not sure why they're the highest, but according to these guys, they're the highest, but it's only 10%. You get down to the other kinds of engineers, uh, get down to architects, and it's way less than 5% chance of being taken over. So if you're looking at automation being able to replace all the people that you have, probably not going to happen. The best one, HR professionals, man, they, nobody's going to replace them, right? <laughs> As the labor market gets tighter and tighter, what we're going to see is we're going to see higher wages and we're going to see lower availability of people. If you think it's tight now, it's only going to get worse. 
This is a study we did a couple of years ago in 2014 where we compared uh, the starting salaries of the kinds of people that are most often employed, kinds of professionals that are most often employed in this industry, civil, mechanical, electricals, and architects. We compared in blue data from the National Association of Colleges and Employers, the median starting salary in, in 2014 for all employers. We then looked at PSMJ data, and we took the top quartile of people that are starting out right out of school with those degrees that are employed in the A&E industry. And the one that really jumps out is civils. The average salary for civil engineers is about $62,000, and it's about $52,000 from A&E firms. This is as of 2014. That's a big difference. Architects, um, nobody pays architects much, so it's not an issue. <laughs> Mechanical, electrical, a little bit less, but, but this is a big issue. So are we really going to get the best and brightest graduates if we're paying particularly engineers, significantly below what they can make in other fields or in other, other employers. And especially when you look at this, those same engineering and architecture graduates are graduating with a whole lot more debt than we did when we were in school. Okay, And so that extra $10,000 a month or a year is a huge deal for new graduates. And if we don't change that, we're going to be getting the leftovers. Another trend that we see is increasing emphasis on teleworking. If you look back 10 years ago, 2007, the median firm in our industry paid about a third of the expenses for computer hardware for people who chose to work at home and were allowed to work at home. Fast forward 10 years, it's now two thirds. Computer software went from 43% to 73%. And communications expenses went from 25% to 39%. So you can see that firms are now really embracing the idea of teleworking, and it's becoming pretty much the norm. And with the younger generation, a lot of people want to be able to do that, especially if they live in cities that have horrible traffic to drive to work every day. Um, if you're not doing it, you're probably getting left behind. I want to talk about CH2M. Uh, has anybody not hear, heard the news that they're being acquired by Jacobs? Yeah, that's probably the biggest, the, the worst kept secret in the world. Uh, they, the deal's supposed to close in November. What happened to CH2M? I mean, CH2M, it was like one of the iconic firms of our industry, and they're, they're soon to be gone. The deal's supposed to close in November. What happened to them is they got trapped by demographics. If you look at all workers in the United States, and, and this is true in our industry as well, <clears throat> the ages from, 60, from 55 and over, those are people who are selling stock. The ages from 35 to 54, those are people who are buying stock. Okay, the people that are under 35, they're not buying stock, they're too young. The people that are over 54, they're not buying stock, they're selling it. <clears throat> so if you look at what's happened from 2010 to 2016, what you're seeing is a substantial increase in the number of sellers and a stamp substantial decrease in the number of buyers. And what happened to CH, and a good friend of mine is a senior VP there, so I get a lot of information from him. <clears throat> what happened to CH is they simply didn't have enough people to buy all their shares. They had thousands of shareholders at CH, and even though they had a quarterly stocks offering, there just weren't enough people demographically available and enough money available to buy them out. So they ended up having to sell the company outside. Now, this is obviously a huge company, hard to, for most people here to relate to that. But the same thing's happening in your firms. Uh, this, is, this is simply a magnification of a, of a trend that's going on everywhere. And if you look at your own firm and you look at your demographics, and if they look like this, you're going to have an ownership transition challenge. And the longer you wait, the worse it's going to be. Uh, what we tell people when we do our ownership transition roundtable is for the sellers to get full value in their shares, you need to have a 10-year transition plan. That's more true now than ever because of this. Let's look at some financial performance in the A&E industry. 
Utilization, that's, uh, how, how many people here look at utilization every once in a while? Yeah, okay, yeah, I thought so. So utilization uh, has been fairly stable. It dropped very slightly from, 2000, from our 2016 survey to 2017. By the way, these years here are the year of our survey publication date. So the 2017 survey covers 2016 data. If we go back to 1980 when we first tr started tracking this, you can see the pattern has been going down. Uh, there's a long-term downward trend in utilization. Why is that? Well, there's several factors, but the predominant factor is automation. Um, anybody here old enough to remember drafting rooms? Okay, drafting boards, remember drafting boards and drafters, right? A actually, I, they weren't drafters back then, they were draftsmen because there was no women, right? They were draftsmen and, uh, and they, had spent 40 hours every week or more, all billable. Week in, week out, and there was a bunch of them. They're gone, and they have been replaced by CAD and now by BIM, and you don't see those people anymore, and those hours aren't being billed. That's one reason. Um, back in the day, when you had the drafting rooms, anybody have an IT manager? No, we didn't have an IT manager. There was no IT to manage. Okay, I mean, a drafting machine was about it, right? And, and, and it didn't require batteries. Uh, that's changed too. Not only do people have IT managers, who by the way are 100% on overhead practically, many of you have IT departments who are 100% on overhead. So you've got more overhead, less direct labor. This is not gonna change. This is gonna continue going down. Another big cost is group insurance, uh, health insurance, uh, life insurance, your, your basic group insurance policy. And that's really gone through two, three different phases. During the 1990s, the increase, and this is, this is the amount that it cost the company, not the individual, the company. So during the 1980s, they really increased pretty modestly. It stayed around $2,000 per employee. During the 2000s, the decade of the 2000s, it went from $2,000 per employee up to about $5,500 per employee, more than double it, really steepened. Since then, it's actually flattened out, and it's gone from about $5,500 to about $6,000 over the last decade. <clears throat> so this is no longer a huge increase to us. Even the most ardent opponents of Obamacare don't want to touch what's happening to group insurance. They're just talking about the exchanges, which definitely have a problem. But in terms of group insurance, that seems to be working reasonably well. Now, some of this is because you guys are putting more costs onto your employees, either in the form of higher premiums or more commonly higher deductibles. Um, but nonetheless, from an impact to our industry, it's really not very severe. Overhead rates, interestingly enough, are trending down. Now this is a little bit counterintuitive if you look at this. If utilization is going up, or if utilization is dropping, overhead rates should be increasing. And the reason that this is happening is non-labor overhead, particularly office space, has been declining. Um, most firms ended the recession around here, around 2010, with a bunch of extra office space. They couldn't sublet it, and they was just sitting there, they were paying rent on it. As firms have grown, they've grown into their space, and so as a percent of direct labor, office space costs have declined, and office co space costs are a pretty significant overhead expense. So that's why we're seeing this. I do not expect this to continue. I expect this to level off and then start to increase again. This is the most frustrating graph I have. Um, <laughs> for decades, we have been preaching the gospel of raising prices, okay? Decades. And, and everybody says, yeah, 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 we get it, we get it. You know, going all the way back to 1978, when a Harvard MBA student did PSMJ's first financial performance survey as his, PH, as his MBA uh, dissertation, from 1978 until about 2004, the median target multiplier was stuck at 
It was literally, the, the variability was literally less than the thickness of this green line. And then, you know, it, it kind of went up a little bit, and now it's leveled off at 3.1. I, I'm going to ask this question. I love to ask this question. How many people here have raised your prices over the past couple of years? Raise your hand if you've raised your prices. Okay, good number of people. Now, of the people who just raised your hands, how many of you regret raising your prices because you lost too much work as a result? Raise your hands nice and high. Come on. Look around, folks. Three-fourths of the people here have raised their prices not one regrets doing it because they lost too much work. Is there a message there? Okay, you haven't raised them enough. That's the message. If you look at achieve multiplier, it's a different picture. <clears throat> the achieve multiplier has actually gone up. We first started tracking, well, this, we actually tracked it earlier than this, but this graph goes back to 1991, and you can see that the achieve multiplier has been steadily increasing. It actually took a little bit of a dip this past year, not good, but overall the long-term trend has been up. If we compare these two graphs, the target multiplier in green with the achieved multiplier in red, that, that delta is what we call net revenue deficit. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's how much firms lose by not achieving their target multiplier. Okay? And the good news is we've gotten way better at this. Back in 1978, Firms were targeting a 2.6, they were targeting a 3 multiplier, but they only got a 2.65. That gap has gradually closed. It, it opened up a little bit here, but overall you can see how, in the last few years how much smaller it is. That's better project management. Now, we can thank people like Dell Tech, Clearview, uh, all of the suppliers of financial software. Anybody, was anybody... Raise your hand if you were in business in 1978. Anybody in business in 1978? What kind of software did you have? <laughs> software? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, our so a ledger book, right? Yeah. Project managers got practically no information. If they did get it, it was, it was weeks late, uh, questionable accuracy. So one reason for improvement in project management is project so project management software, financial software, has gotten way better. Another reason is training. Nobody trained project managers in 1978. Everybody trains project managers today. So I think those two things have really caused this. If we look at revenue factor, also known as net payroll multiplier, um, it actually took a little bit of a dip this year. And because profitability follows that, profitability also took a little bit of a dip. It went, it went from about... Uh, 16% uh, down to around 15% is median profitability. So that's not good. Uh, the dollars of profit for the industry were about the same because revenue went up by about 8% and, profit, and, and profitability went down by about 8%. So the average firm, if there is such a thing, had about the same amount of dollars of profit in 2016 as they had in, 2017, in 2015, but the profitability dropped. That is not good. I hope that's not going to continue. Looking at, uh, for those of you who are shareholders, this is a really important one. What's the return on your shareholders' equity? Uh, it dropped also, but still pretty good. Uh, above 20% is not bad. Another negative trend is accounts receivable. Now, we had a lot of progress from the mid-'90s accounts receivable collection, total collection days, this is WIP plus AR, um, declined from about 100 all the way down to about 84. But the last few years, it's been climbing back up. This is an interesting one. It's equity per staff. And, and this is a way we look at balance sheets. If, if you have a high equity per staff on your balance sheet, what that means is you have a good cushion against the ups and downs of the business cycle. If you have a low equity per staff, then your cushion is pretty thin. And so this is a measure of how much cushion firms have. And you can see that going back to 1991, it kind of gradually increased sort of with inflation. And then all of a sudden, 2013, it went from about $22,000 to $35,000, just boom, in two years. What happened? What happened was the recession hit 
firms really hard. A lot of firms had capital calls among the partners just to make payroll. Uh, anybody here have a capital call to make payroll? Okay, a lot of fun. And so even the firms that didn't have capital calls came pretty close and had to, had to borrow more from the bank. Insurance and architects are risk averse. They're debt averse. They didn't like that. And so they decided we're going to put more money aside. Instead of bonus sitting out, we're going to put more money into our balance sheet. And so it went from 22,000 to 35,000 in just two years. This year, pretty much leveled off. So that's, that's a snapshot of where we are today. Let's take a look at where we think we're going to be. And when you plan your firm strategy, we recommend taking advice from the great one, Wayne Gretzky. <clears throat> Don't skate to where the puck is. Skate to where it's going to be. Don't look at where, what are the hot markets today. Look at what they're going to be. The way to do that is if you look at the typical life cycle, first thing that happens is proposal opportunities either go up or down, and then backlog follows that, revenues follow that, and cash flow follows that, and if you're in construction, there's another delay there. Okay, and the typical lifespan from proposal opportunities to cash flow is somewhere between one and two years. So if you want to see what's going to happen to your cash flow a year or two from now, look at proposal opportunities today. That's the most leading indicator. That's what we look at the hardest. So we do a survey every quarter in these months. Um, it's a free service. Uh, we charge for the report unless you participate in the survey, in which case we give it to you for free. Uh, it's just A&E firms, not construction firms. We generally have anywhere from about 200 people to 500 people in each quarterly survey. I think this past one we had about 300. And we chart what we call a plus-minus index. And for those of you who haven't seen this, I'll just show you. These are the markets that we look at. We look at major markets, and then we look at sub-markets. There's like 55 different markets that we look at. Uh, this is the way we compute our plus-minus index. For example, one of the questions on the survey is, um, are proposal opportunities in the transportation sector increasing or decreasing compared to last quarter? And, and the questions are all pretty much like this. So here's a sample. Let's say 185 people answered this question. And let's say that 60 of them said, we're seeing more opportunities this quarter than last quarter. That's plus one. That's plus 60 points. 80 of them said, it's about the same. That's zero. And 45 of them said, it's decreasing. That's minus one. So we take that. The total points in this case are plus 15. Divide that by the number of people participating, 185. And that gives us an index of plus 8%. So if the same number of people seeing an increase and a decrease, it's zero. If everybody's seeing a, an increase, it's plus 100. If everyone's seeing a decrease, it's minus 100. So I'm going to show a bunch of graphs. This is how you read that graph. So here's the first one. This is overall proposal opportunities. And you can see here we were coming into the recession. Boom. You know, proposal opportunities were really dropping. But... Since about 2009, they've actually been positive. We had one quarter where it was right at zero. But other than that, we've been seeing increasing proposal opportunities quarter over quarter every quarter since 2009. That's a long time. If we look at the most recent results, which is for the second quarter of this year, and we look at it regionally, there's not much difference. Uh, just about every region is pretty much the same. The, 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 the slowest or the, the, the smallest region in terms of proposed opportunities is the Midwest, but it's still pretty good at plus 24. And uh, then you've got uh, even the Northeast uh, and the West Coast around 37%. So very healthy growth all across the regions. Let's take a look at this guy. And uh, let's take a look at the Trump effect on our industry and see if there is one. And the first thing that I want to look at is President Trump's promise to bring manufacturing jobs back to America. So let's look at some data. In, if you look at industrial production, here you can see it was actually declining for a while, leveled off in, in late 2015, kind of flat. Here's where Trump was elected, and you can see there has been a significant uptick in industrial production. I mean, significant. Um, can you attribute this to, to everything that Donald Trump's done? I don't know, but I think you can probably attribute some of it to it. 
So yeah, there has definitely been an increase. Um, if you look in the future uh, at, the, at Federal Reserve, Fred, by the way, is not some guy. It's the Federal Reserve. Uh, and, and they're expecting capital expenditures to keep increasing. So those of you who are serving manufacturing clients, picture looks good. But job growth, which is what President Trump, candidate Trump promised, really hasn't picked up much. If you look at where Trump was elected here, job growth has been pretty flat. So what's happening is in manufacturing, there's more manufacturing activity, but they're not hiring more people to do it. They're buying more robots. And so even though manufacturing is increasing, it's not creating jobs. Let's look at that sector with our data. If we look at the heavy industry market, looks really solid. It went, went, went way down during the recession, but you can see um, the, the plus minus index has been solidly plus for a long time. So manufacturing outlook opportunities, proposal opportunities in manufacturing are great. If you break it down into sub-markets, and this data was before Hurricane Harvey, okay? It's gonna be interesting. I, th I'm, I think there's gonna be some change here, okay? This is all before Harvey. Um, petroleum was down and chemical plants were down. Well, where did Harvey, Harvey hit? In the heart of the petroleum and chemical industry. So I think, this is, I think these reds are going to change to greens here in the next one. Uh, but by and large, it's been kind of a mixed bag, but overall positive. If we look at light industry, uh, also looks really good. Uh, the quarter over quarter plus minus index has been really solid. If we look at, at the sub-markets within, within light industry, all three of them are very solid. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, coal miners get ready to go back to work. Well, let's talk about that one. And, and, and that really leads into a, what I think is a really important issue for our overall economy in the U.S. and in Canada, maybe even more so in Canada than in the U.S., and that's the whole energy picture. So let's talk a little bit about that. This is a graph I've showed for the last few years, just to get a historical perspective. From the time that the United States was founded until about 1850, wood was the sole energy source in the United States. Wood gradually died down in favor of coal, but around the turn of the last century, coal started decreasing and becoming a less and less important energy source versus petroleum, natural gas, and other things. So, over the decades, you can see that there's been gradual but important changes in the energy mix. Let's take a look at uh, coal mining jobs, which is what President Trump or candidate Trump promised to bring back. So from 2012 to 2016, yeah, there was a big decrease. Uh, we went from 90,000 coal mining jobs down to about 50,000 coal mining jobs, almost half. And it has seemed to stabilize a little bit, and maybe there's even a little bit of an upturn here. So we can give President Trump a little bit of credit for that, I think. But if you look at the total number of coal mining jobs of around 50,000, that's less than 10% of the jobs on renewable energy, less than 10%. In fact, more people work at Arby's than work in coal mines. So what's happened is, is coal mining has dropped down so much, it's just not even a significant source of jobs anymore. If you look at forecasts for 2040, it's gonna be even worse. In the United States, coal use is expected to drop by 45% and by 87% in Europe. So I would not recommend getting into coal mining, despite what President Trump says. If you look at the Appalachian region, where they're really adding jobs is in natural gas. But the real key picture, what's really happening in the energy front is renewables. And, and we're in the early stages of what I think is a major revolution in th that, that graph that went back to 1776, we're looking at that kind of an impact in the next, gener in the next decades. Right now, renewable energy, coal right now represents about 15% of our energy mix. <clears throat> Renewables, about 10%. If you look at oil production in the United States, um, you can see it peaked here in, uh, let's see, what is that, 2015, when the oil prices started dropping, the amount of oil production dropped. When oil prices went back up, oil production went back up. 
So overall, if you look even as recently as 2010, look at the difference in oil production from 2010 to 2017. It's huge. Natural gas <clears throat> has been somewhat depressed because prices have been low. But there's going to be a big change in the natural gas market. We have traditionally, even recently, been a net importer of natural gas. Starting this July, we're projected to be a net exporter of natural gas. And in the next few years, we're going to be a big exporter of natural gas. That's going to raise prices for natural gas because the world prices are way higher than they are in the U.S. So if anybody is getting those advertisements from the gas companies about locking in your rates, lock them in. Gas prices are going up. But an even more important development in the energy front, I think, is solar. If you look at, at the, the decrease in the cost of solar power, just from 2009 to 2016, it's gone from almost $8, $8 a watt down to two. Excuse <clears throat> me, drop by, drop by three fourths. What's happened, if you look at the capacity, it's gone from practically zero in 2009 up to seven, uh, 7,000 megawatts this year. And look at how steep this curve is. And in fact, if anything, it looks like it's, it's accelerating. 2009 wasn't that long ago. If you add up, the populations of all the countries shown in red, it's about two-thirds of the world population. By 2021, not very far, solar will be cheaper than coal in every one of these countries. Two-thirds of the world's population, it'll be cheaper than coal. By 2040, solar costs are expected to drop from, from today's level by two-thirds. If we look at global power generation, um, this is projected expenditures by 2040. 72% of the expenditures are going to be from, from solar and wind, almost three-fourths solar and wind by 2040. Everything else is going to be 28%. It's kind of a weird graph, but basically what it says is wind power, not just solar, but wind power is now becoming competitive with natural gas in a lot of places, in an increasing number of places. And if you look at the predictions for 2040, onshore wind power is expected to drop by almost half, and offshore by over 70% by 2040. So not just solar is coming down, wind power is coming down a lot. One of the big bottlenecks has been battery production. And look what's happened in battery production. Um, look at, at, at these are the largest battery manufacturers. This is the amount, take Panasonic, for example. Um, Panasonic this year is producing something like 12 gigawatt hours per year in battery pr production. By 2020, just three years from now, it's going to be over 50. So look at how much increased battery production there's going to be. And, and this is already baked into the cake. These are projects that are already in, underway, so this is going to happen. So if we look at penetration of energy by renewables, uh, we're seeing 38% increase. This is by 2040 in the U.S., but in India, China, and Germany, it's way higher. Why is our so low compared to theirs? Because Trump is devoted to keeping coal jobs. Okay, and supporting traditional energy sources. I think it's a, in terms of jobs, I think that is probably the single biggest policy mistake uh, that's being made right now, is trying to protect those jobs. It's over, man. Get over it. Put those people to work on renewables. But right now, it doesn't look like it's going to happen nearly to the extent as it will in these other places. Another interesting thing that's happened, if you go back to 1990, Look at the increase in GDP. It's almost doubled since 1990. But look at the amount of energy consumption since 1990. It's barely gone up at all. We're producing almost twice as much GDP with almost the same amount of energy that we used to. So there's, and these two graphs used to be like linked together, ironclad year after year. Since about 1990, 
big difference. We're becoming way more energy efficient. That plus the fracking and solar and other domestic sources have made us much more energy independent. Going back just 11 years to 2006, we were importing 30% of our energy. This year, 9%. And if you look at the trends, it, that's, going to be, that's going to be zero, and it's probably going to go the other way within the next two or three years. So we're not only going to be energy independent, which has been a dream of people for decades, ever since the, the, the Arab oil embargo of the 70s, I think we're going to be a ex net exporter. So let's look at our industry. Uh, if we look at the energy and utilities market, um, it's been really strong. Uh, going back to 2007, I mean, it's been in solid positive territory, quarter over quarter increases in proposal opportunities, really solid market. If you look at renewables in particular, there was kind of a dip around 2012. Never actually went negative. We never actually saw fewer proposal opportunities. But boy, since then, it's been really positive. So we're seeing in our industry way more proposal opportunities in renewables for the reasons that those other charts showed. And I think that's going to continue. If we look at mining and resource extracting, this includes oil and gas, fracking, and so on, um, I think there's a Trump effect here. If you look at before the election, we were seeing negative plus minus indexes, significantly negative plus minus indexes. In other words, there were very few proposal opportunities before the election. That has really turned around. And now there's significant positive proposal opportunities. So I think we can give Mr. Trump some credit for improving the outlook for those of you who work in the mining and resource extraction industries, or for those of you who are thinking about getting into it. Uh, if we look at the pipeline market, this is another sub-market. Again, I think there's definitely a Trump effect. Uh, you could see that the, that the plus minus index was dropping and dropping and dropping, and here's the election, and boy, it has bounced back. So there's definitely a Trump effect here. Utility distribution has been pretty strong, but the last couple of quarters are a little bit troubling. We're starting to see a decline here. If that continues, this market may not be so good. Power plants, I mentioned that graph that showed the efficiency of energy use in the United States. Well, that means we don't need as many power plants. And, and especially with putting, people putting in their own solar and their own batteries, we don't need as many new power plants. And so we're seeing a gradual decline in the market for power plant work in our industry, proposal opportunities. Here's another one. We're going to make America's infrastructure great again. Well, so far, that's all talk. Okay, So far, there hasn't been an extra dollar spent on infrastructure, but let's look at it anyway. During the recession, there was a pretty major infrastructure expenditure as part of the President Obama's stimulus plan. And so when you look at the government share of construction activity, which of course was down in the private sector as well as being up in the public sector, it was way high. It, was, it reached almost 40 percent. Almost 40 cents out of every dollar of construction was spent by government. In the years since then, it's dropped to about 23 percent. That's a big, big drop. In fact, you have to go all the way back uh, pre-recession days before it was that low, and, 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 it's, and it's reaching historical lows. So government has been spending less and less compared to private sector. But if you look at the forecasts, they're pretty good. Um, even though investment, overall in investment in infrastructure has been declining somewhat, uh, the forecasts for this year and for next year are actually pretty good. And it's not so much that we need new capacity, it's that things are falling apart. If you're designing walls, there may be some opportunities for you. I don't know. We'll have to see. Let's look at our industry. So here's roads. Uh, now, again, this is with no additional infrastructure expenditures, all the trillion dollars that were promised. This is just what's happening right now. Without all this additional money, look at the increase in the plus-minus index on proposal opportunities for roads. It is really a hot market. Bridges, same thing, really a hot market. Railway, again, traffic, I mean, 
just about every aspect of transportation looks really good. Transportation planning, uh, airports. So right now, things look really good, but I see some clouds on the horizon here. Um, the traditional relationship between vehicle miles traveled and fuel consumption has started to diverge. People, first of all, this line is flattening out. People are not traveling more like they used to. This used to go up every year. It's kind of flatlined. But even more important is the amount of fuel consumption is now significantly below. That's a function of primarily more fuel efficient cars. And cars are continuing to become more fuel efficient. But there's another factor, and that is electrical vehicles. And if you look at different projections, I mean, you know, here's 2020. Even in 2020, electrical vehicles are, are a tiny fraction of the market. But if you look at the decades to come, it's going to be way, way bigger. Electrical vehicles use no gasoline. So gasoline taxes as a way of paying for infrastructure isn't going to work. So one option maybe is P3 projects, public-private partnerships. Those haven't been increasing either. If we look at since 2012, the number of public and private partner P3 projects has actually been declining in the United States. So that's not taking up the slack. Bottom line on transportation is things are really good right now, but there's going to have to be something different on funding it. <clears throat> Let's look at water and wastewater. Water and wastewater looks really good. <coughs> Excuse me. Water and wastewater looks really good. Um, and climate change, uh, John's from Houston, so John, maybe you recognize this picture. This is Houston uh, after Harvey. That is going to create a lot of work in the water arena of all kinds, storm water management, all kinds of work in the water arena. No question in my mind about that. Let's look at um, another Trump effect. And that is Trump's promise to roll back all the environmental regulations that were promulgated by the previous President Obama. I, you like this one? I, 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 like, I like this cartoon. I couldn't, I couldn't leave this cartoon out of the presentation. Um, and, and, you know, there's really some validity here. If you look, going back to 1936, this is the number of pages in the Federal Register. I mean, there has been a massive increase in the number of pages particularly in 2016. I mean, there was a big spike, okay? There's now, almost, it was almost 100,000 pages produced in the Federal Register uh, compared to like, you know, 1,000 back in 1936. So I think, I think maybe people have gotten a little bit carried away with regulations, and I really think that in this particular area of policy, I, I think President Trump is, is right on. We need a little bit less regulation, and I think Cutting back on a lot of that regulation, you've seen the impact and proposal opportunities for things like pipelines and so on. I think that's the result of that. But because a lot of these regulations are environmental regulations, there's been a question of well, what's going to happen to environmental firms. So let's take a look at our proposal data regarding environmental firms. Overall, the environmental markets look really good. Uh, the plus-minus index has been very solid for the last 10 years. And if you look at all the environmental submarkets, they're pretty good too. So even though there's been a cutback on environmental regulations at the federal level, it doesn't seem to have impacted environmental firms' proposal opportunities significantly. Now, a lot of that is because a lot of the environmental regulations are not federal. A lot of them are state and local. And so, you know, it has no effect on those. <clears throat> How long is this going to go on? Okay, everybody's, everybody's right now kind of riding the wave and things are good. At some point, we're going to have another recession. Okay, I will stand up here and guarantee you we will have another recession. I can't tell you when, but I can tell you we're going to have another one. Now, is it going to happen soon? I don't know. Historically, um, our average time between recessions has been about 73 months. We are now at 96 months. So by this measure, we're kind of overdue. So it means we got to watch this thing. There's two kinds of recessions. There's normal recessions, 
And then there's the Whoppers. The Whoppers were the 1930 de Depression and the 2008 Great Recession. Those are the Whoppers, okay? And they're each caused by different things. My Outlook account settings are out of date. Thank you very much for letting me know about that. Normal recessions happen, uh, and they're just a function of the business cycle. And, and the Federal Reserve has gotten pretty good at attenuating normal recessions. They still happen, but they're not nearly as severe as they used to be. The whoppers are caused by debt. And when countries start getting into big debt problems, that's when you really have to be careful. So let's look at debt. You can see running up to the last recession, this is total private and public sector debt in the United States. And you can see when it got up to a certain level, I mean, that was a tinderbox waiting for something to ignite it, and that something was the housing crisis. But if it wasn't the housing crisis, it would have been something else. Well, the good news is that debt has come down, and it's, and it's trending downward. And as long as it keeps trending downward, that's good. But it's still at a very high level historically, and I'm still a little bit worried about it. If you really want an indicator as to when their next recession is going to be, housing activity is what we find is the best indicator. If you look at, our, at PSMJ's plus minus trends, going back to 2003, these are just year-end numbers here. And if, if you look at 2003, in the housing industry, plus minus index went from 40% to 25% to about 10%. By 2006, it was down to zero. Look at the, for, forget, forget these last three points. If you were just tracking this number here, by the end of 2006, what would your conclusion be? It ain't looking good, folks. But think about, it. at the end of 2006, did anybody see the recession coming? Nobody, not even the most brilliant Chicago economists saw the recession coming. But if you were paying attention to this, you'd see it coming. And sure enough, boom, it happened. So let's look at the housing market. If that's, if that's a bellwether, then let's, let's look at how it's doing. Well, it's doing pretty darn well. And, and we're not seeing this kind of a downward trend. This, this is what I'm going to look for for the next recession. We're not seeing it. So far, these plus minus numbers look really good. They're staying solid. As long as these numbers stay, stay solid, I feel pretty comfortable that the next year or two are going to be good. There's an even more important bellwether than the overall housing activity, and that is subdivisions. When people build subdivisions, how many people here are in the housing subdivision market? Raise your hand. Okay, handful. Um, when people build subdivisions, they build shopping malls. They build uh, storage units, they build roads, they build bridges, water systems, wastewater treatment plants, schools, uh, energy distribution facilities, courthouses, libraries, all these other things get built when people build subdivisions. So if you're in any of these markets, you're in the housing subdivision market. You just don't know it. And so we really can look at housing subdivision as, as the linchpin of what's going to happen to all these other markets, which together comprise about 80% of the overall economy in our industry. So here's our graph for subdivision market, and it was a disaster during the recession. Look at the low point, which was the fourth quarter of 2008. The plus minus index was minus 90%. Okay, why was it not minus 100%? because there was still a little bit of activity in the senior housing sector, and that was it. Everything else was dead. Well, it gradually came back and finally broke through zero, and it looked pretty stable. And in fact, the last few quarters have actually been going up. So not just the overall housing market, but in particularly housing subdivision market looks pretty good. Again, makes me pretty sanguine about the next couple of years. If we look at housing submarkets, sub condos are kind of flat. The others are looking pretty strong. Housing is very much a local market. Um, the, the green areas are areas of growth. The red areas are areas of shrinkage. And you can see there's a lot of green on this map and not very much red. Look at that map in 2008. 
Not much green on that map, tons of red. Okay, as long as this map stays green, we're in pretty good shape. A little worried about you Canadians, okay? Canadian home prices have really gone up, and that could be a problem. So that's one that I think you have to kind of keep your eye on. Let's look at some of the other market sectors. Uh, commercial developers look really good, for those of you who are in this market. Uh, commercial users, these are, these are people like big box stores that, that own their own facilities, looks really good. Uh, healthcare looks good. Education looks very good. Uh, other government buildings, which were kind of a laggard coming out of the recession, is starting to really pick up steam, and those are, those are starting to look pretty good in terms of proposal opportunities. If we look at all the sectors together, for over the last two quarters, the red circles are the first quarter of 2017, and the, the blue triangles are the second quarter, everything to the right of zero means proposal opportunities are increasing rather than decreasing. And right now, they're all looking pretty good. Another interesting thing to look at is, is not just proposal opportunities, which tell you how much work there is, but I think it's instructive to also look at the profitability of that work. One of the trivia questions yesterday, for those of you who were at the trivia contest, which market sector is the least profitable? Here it is, folks, transportation. Uh, and, and let me just explain how we did this. Let's take two, take, this is data for 2016. When we compared the profitability the median profitability for all firms that did more than 50% of their work in transportation versus the overall A&E industry, transportation firms were 1.4% less profitable. They have been less profitable every year since 2010 and probably long before that. Government buildings, on the other hand, have turned really positive. They've gone from, you can see, from minus 2 to plus 2 to plus 6 to plus 12. So you can look at these patterns here, and you can see not only how much work there is, but at least equally important, how much profit there is in these different markets. And I think this is something that people don't look at nearly enough when they're doing their strategic planning and figuring out what markets they want to be in and what markets they want to be out. How do we assess the markets? We look at three things. Um, we look at short term long-term, and profitability. And we assign each of them a ranking between minus two, which is terrible, and plus two, which is great. So here's our assessment right now. Short-term prospects, long-term prospects, relative profitability. We add those points up, and you can see right now, number one with a perfect score is housing. And then it works on down. There are no reds on here. Anything with a negative score would be in red. There's no reds. All markets are good, but some are better than others. So what do we do with all this information? Recommendations. One, track the results every quarter. You can, you can, we're, we're happy to sell you the, the book, but we're even happier to give it to you for free if you just participate in the survey. And that survey is going on right now, by the way. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Listen to Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck's going to be, not to where it is today, and prepare for a labor shortage that's going to, eat, that's going to get worse and worse and worse. So about participating in our surveys, um, I mentioned the quarterly market survey. Uh, it's actually open right now for the next week or so. And uh, if you go to this site right here and click on the Participate Now button, uh, you can enter your information. We'll, and we will send you the report for free. Uh, or you can stop by the PSMJ booth and find out about that. Uh, our management and staff compensation survey uh, is January and February of next year, and our financial performance survey is January through April of next year, and we hope that you participate in that too. Couple, just a couple of new things from PSMJ that I thought you might be interested in. Uh, one is that a few months ago we created the AEC Project Management Association, which is the first association of its kind for project managers in our industry. Think of PMI for the AEC industry. Uh, we also have completed a series of 20 e-learning modules that go from suit to nuts in project management. You can find more about that. And we just completed this week, actually, in partnership with one of our sponsors, uh, Talent Matters, an aptitude test for potential project managers so that you can actually find out if, how 
what their odds of success are. And here's ways to get more information. So we made it through 135 slides. Um, questions or comments? How do you guys see all this? <laughs> any questions? Or any, anybody see anything different than this? Yes, um, is Melissa here? Um, how, do I, how do they get copies of the slides, Melissa? They're on the USB drive. Oh, okay, they're on the USB. So everybody already has them. They're on the USB and, drive. And they'll be on the cloud. And, oh, and, and they'll be on the cloud, too. Yes. So you can be, get them either way. <laughs> yes? Is there anything you can tell us about what the next recession will look like? Question is, what do I think the next recession will look like? Boy, that's a really tough one. Um, you know, the problem with recessions is you know they're going to come, but every single one looks different than the other ones. So I, I'm, I'm just not sure. But, but one thing I am pretty sure about is if, you, if we track these quarterly surveys, it's going to tell us where that next recession is going to hit in our industry because you're going to be able to see it in every one of these curves. So I think, you know, th those are things we need to look for. Um, and it's going to affect people in certain sectors and not in others. You know, for example, one, I guess one thing I think it will affect, if you're in the power plant business, it's going to hit you. Some of these long-term trends are definitely going to hit recessions. Yeah? You showed a slide about uh, automation and robots taking over jobs. What do you think in terms of the changes in our industry and the effect of automation and them and just technology? I mean, just like we talked about earlier with the, the drafting aspect when we were looking at direct labor, Yeah, the question is, what, what do I see happening in technology in our industry? BIM is clearly on its way to becoming universal. Um, I, I think there's no question about that. That's probably the biggest single technological breakthrough in our industry. Now, in the construction industry, that's where robotics, uh, my good friend Barry LePatton and I were talking about that yesterday. And I do believe that we're going to see a lot more emphasis on uh, robotics in construction. But in our industry, I don't really see that happening. I think BIM, once it becomes universal, what that's going to mean is it's going to change the way we produce documents completely. And it's going to change the way that we, that we provide those documents to contractors. So I, I think that's probably going to be the biggest change. And, P, and, and project managers and project architects and project engineers are going to have to get used to producing documents in a very different format than the typical orthographic projections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the employment numbers that I showed for engineering firms versus architecture firms versus construction is really more a function of the demand than it is the supply. Uh, I think the, de the demand for engineering services has, has picked up faster and is greater than the demand for architecture service. But, but both of them are increasing. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, there seems to be political momentum for a single payer. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I don't think that there's enough political support in the United States to ever pass uh, single payer, ever. Um, what's going to happen? There will be some sort of a messy compromise between the Democrats and the Republicans uh, to deal with the exchanges, and I think everything else is going to stay pretty much the same. Yeah, question is, is um, retail is part of commercial, both commercial users and commercial developers. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. If you're in retail, with some exceptions, you're looking for trouble. Uh, retail is heading south big time. I mean, look, Toys R Us just closed, right? Uh, iconic, why well, they didn't close in Chapter 11. Um, yeah, retail, traditional retail is definitely heading down. Now, there's some exceptions. 
um, firm we work with in Florida, they do a lot of work for um, uh, convenience stores, uh, a lot of work for, for grocery stores. Those aren't going away. People are not going to start buying those things online. So there are sectors in retail that people are still going to go to the store for. But increasingly, if it can be bought online, it will be bought online way more than it is now. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, comment is uh, start, they're starting to see a merger of design and construction. Are we firms? Are we starting to see that merger? You know, that's been kind of a background noise that's been going on for a while, but it's not always a happy marriage. And in fact, if you look at CH2M, used to be CH2M Hill, CH2M, their demise really was perpetrated by that merger. When they got into the yellow iron construction business, that's where they got into over their heads. They had a couple of really bad projects uh, that cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. And they weren't bad in the engineering, they were bad in the construction. I don't, the cultures of design firms and construction firms are so different. Uh, when I was at Parsons, we had, we had both a union company and a non-union company, and boy, I'll tell you, it was tough working together. Uh, the cultures are just so different. So I, I don't see that being the long-term model. I really don't. In fact, I showed the design build. We're not seeing the big guys increasing in that. I, I, think, I think you're going to have the designers separately, separate from the builders for a long time. Got time for one more question. Yeah. Which means by 2050, we're going to have... Yeah, can you repeat that? I, I'm having a hard time hearing you up here. We, and from a demographic standpoint, 2.1 million new residents in the United States every year, which means by 2050, we'll have 100 million more people in our nation. As a result, we're gonna have new towns, new villages, new cities all over the South and Southwest where the growth is. How does that impact the AE industry over the next decade or two? Well. Population growth is a huge driver for just about every part of the A&E industry. I mean, if, if population isn't growing, there are very few markets that are growing in our industry. Um, so where the growth is is going to be where the population grows. That's where, we're, where our industry grows. Now, I'm not sure if we're going to continue growing by 2% a year. Um, you know, with the current administration's desire to cut back on immigration, because most of that growth is immigration. You know, it's not people being born, it's immigrants. And I, I don't know if we're gonna keep that growth. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a drop. Two, 2.1 million people a year? Yeah, I'm not sure that's gonna continue. So, we'll see. Well, I'm out of time. I don't wanna take into your break time. So thank you very much. If anybody wants to talk about any of this uh, offline, I'll be wandering around and I'd be delighted to talk to any of you about it. So we, what do we got next, John? We got break and then? I've got some comments. Okay, go ahead. Dave Burstein, everyone. Dave Burstein.